What will we do if the letter doesn't arrive in time? I used to see myself his wife in a neat, cheap gown. Seeing him come in tired, taking off his hat and coat for him. Don't! Why not? If your husband heard you. It wouldn't surprise him. The name was all I kept from him, and he has discovered it. How? Oh. Rome. We were at a party given to the English by the Wakelands. She had the reputation of sketching very beautifully. Something I said attracted her attention to me. Please let me recommend a drawing master. I've had all sorts of teachers, but the very best of all was a Mr. Hartwright. I'm sure you will like him. I did all I could to control myself. But I saw by his look my face had betrayed me. When we got back to the hotel, he pushed me down into a chair. You and Hartwright shall repent it to the last hours of your lives. Now go to bed and dream of him if you like, with the marks of my horsewhip on his back. Oh, Marion, don't. You hurt. Look. Over there. Was it a man or a woman? I'm not sure. A woman. No, it was a man in a big cloak. Excuse to be away from the house. Pray don't let me disturb you. I've just come in to find a book. I am one of those unfortunate men, Miss Halcombe, who suffer from the heat. I wish I could change places with my excellent wife. She's as cool as a fish in the moat outside. I'm never warm, Miss Halcombe. Have you and Lady Glyde been out this evening? Yes, as far as the boathouse. To take a little air. No more adventures? No more discoveries? No adventures. No discoveries. Good night. Dear Miss Halcombe, in the absence of Mr. Gilmore, my careful consideration of your statement and my knowledge of Lady Glyde's position lead me to the conclusion that a flagrant breach of trust is intended and that by seeking her signature, her approval could be produced against her, should she complain hereafter. In the event of Lady Glyde signing such a document, 
her trustee would be at liberty to advance money to Sir Percival out of her £20,000. Such a transaction, for anything Lady Glyde knows to the contrary, may be a fraud upon her unborn children. Oh! <laughs> Oh, bravo, bravo! Bravo! Bravissimo! Oh, bene, bene. letter for anyone? Yes, for Miss Halcombe, ma'am. You may give it to me. I am Miss Halcombe. <whistles> Will you be so good as to say that I understand the letter and I am very much obliged? There is no other reply at present. Well, thank you, ma'am. Good day, ma'am. Good day. Going back to the house, Miss Halton. You look surprised. Surely even so old a man as Fosco is better than no escorts at all. Here I am, may I say it, at the height of my wishes.
grown up, she said something to me. And the next day, your husband... Tell me. No. Not now. We're not alone. We're watched. Come here tomorrow. At this time. By yourself. And if you can't, I shall come every day. You've told me everything. I don't have your powers of memory. I have my diary. Laura, the merest trifles are vital where Aunt Catherick is concerned. Think. No chance reference to where she's living. No. Nor what her illness has been. Nothing. I don't know what to do or think next. You must do this, my love. You must keep that appointment at the boathouse tomorrow. I'll follow you at a safe distance. Nobody shall see me. She's escaped Walter and you. Whatever happens, she shan't escape me. You believe there is a secret? Yes. Look at your husband's conduct. I judge Anne Catherick's words by his actions. A thousand pardons, Miss Halcombe. I only venture to disturb you because I am the bearer of good news. Percival has seen fit to alter his mind, and the business of the signature is put off for the moment. A great relief to all of us, Miss Halcombe, as I see with pleasure in your face. Pray present my best respects and felicitations when you mention this pleasant change of circumstance to Lady Glyde. Marion, hush. How can the matter be put off? There were two alternatives. Your signature on that parchment now postponed. Or you agreeing to pay his debts in three months' time. Where do you think Sir Percival went? Wormingham to Mrs. Catherick. trembling English twilight. I love it. I feel my inborn admiration of all that is noble and great and good, purified by the breath of heaven on an evening like this. Nature has such imperishable charms, such inextinguishable tenderness for me. Yes, why not? Like them. Ah. I'm an old man. Or this would become your lips sound like a mockery on mine, Miss Halcombe. Oh, it is hard to be laughed at in my moment of sentiment, as if my soul were like myself, old and overgrown. Observe, dear lady, what a light is dying on the tree. Does it penetrate your heart as it does mine? Will be a change tomorrow. Laura. Laura.
you know where the lady glide is coming oh, from the walk? I'm afraid something most distressing has happened. An accident? No, no. My lady ran upstairs in tears, and Sir Percival has ordered me to give her maid warning to leave in an hour, and she's been forbidden to appeal to her mistress. I've heard. Where do you intend to sleep tonight? Oh, down at the inn. Uh, the, the landlady is known to the servants. Then tomorrow I'll get to Cumberland. You must expect to hear from your mistress or myself sometime this evening. We'll do everything in our power to help you. Why do you stand there? Don't you see I want to come in? But you mustn't. How dare you talk to me like that? Master's orders. No, a thousand times over, no. But damn it, look at the letter, man! Am I to understand your wife's room as a prison? Yes. And take care yours doesn't become one too. Take you care how you treat your wife and how you threaten me. There are laws in England to protect women from outrage. If you hurt a hair of her head or dare to interfere with my freedom, come what may to those laws, I will appeal. There you are. What did I tell you? What do you say now, hmm? What I said before, no. <clears throat> I have to thank you for your hospitality and to decline taking advantage of it any further. I remain in no house where ladies are treated as your wife and Miss Halcombe have been treated here today. She is sublime. I am at your service, Eleanor. And at Miss Halcombe's too, if she will do me the honor. Damn it, Fosco, what do you mean? At other times I mean what I say, but this time I mean what my wife says. All right, have your own way. Have your own way. See what comes of it. It means that you and I together have brought the worst Water. tempered man in England to his senses. Water, come here. It means, Miss Halcombe, that Lady Glyde is relieved from the gross indignity and you from the repetition of an unpardonable insult. Suffer me to express my admiration. Sincere admiration? Sincere admiration of your conduct and your courage at a very trying moment. I rejoice for all our sakes that Sir Percival's conduct has not obliged the Count and I to leave this house. Miss Halcombe, allow me to inform you that Lady Glyde is mistress again in her own house. Admirable delicacy. Fosco, I want a word with you. And I want to think a little by myself. Later, Percival, later. How did you get here? Oh, what's happened? Gave you leave? I went to the boathouse. There was no one there. Not Percival, he let you here? The Count, of course. Don't Who's speak of him. Laura, listen. The I Count is the vilest creature breathing. The Count is a miserable spy. You dropped this, Miss Harkin. And I thought I would bring it to you as I was passing by on my way to my own room. person watching us yesterday. You did see her. No, she left a note in her home. She described a large old man not fast enough to follow her through the trees, so she didn't dare risk staying. She said she'll tell me the next time we meet I'm to have patience, and she promised, promised to see me again soon. Where's the note? Sir Percival. I tried to hide it. I was alone with him. What could I do? He 
You believe she's told me his secret? We're going to start resisting now. Those marks are a weapon to strike you with. Marion, he made me tell everything. He thinks we're conspiring. He sent Fanny away, and he set that creature to watch me. He's... he's... Mad. If we could only leave this house. Now listen to me, my love, and try to believe you are not quite helpless so long as I am here with you. Fanny shall take two letters. One to Mr. Curl, he's got to know about those bruises, and one to Mr. Fairley. If you could only prevail on him to let me go back to Limbridge for a while. Yes. The pretext of a holiday. It's worth trying. Well, don't leave me. You can write here. Lock it on the inside. It's still falling. I'm afraid we must expect more rain. Aunt Eleanor. I am very, very much afraid. You must have accidentally heard Laura say something which I am unwilling either to repeat or defend. I think it of no importance whatsoever. But I have no secrets from my husband, even in trifles. She spoke while smarting under insult and injustice. Of course. She did me an injustice which I lament and forgive. But let us all combine to forget about it from this moment. You are very kind. You relieve me inexpressibly. I beg you to say no more, Miss Halcombe. I am only shocked that you should find it necessary to say so much. Count, your foreign forms of politeness are misunderstood by English women. Pardon me, my angel. The dearest and best English woman in the world understands them. Try to make the best of it, Fanny. Your mistress and I are your friends. Now listen to me. Poor Lady Glyde. I am going to entrust you with two letters. This one, you are to put in the post when you get to London tomorrow. This one, addressed to Mr. Fairley, you are to keep about you and give up to no one until you get to Limeridge. There you are to say you are in my service until Lady Glyde is able to take you back again. <laughs> So be of good heart and don't miss the train. Please, tell my lady that I left all the things as fresh as I could in the time. Oh, who will dress her for dinner tonight?
You're always talking of patience. My good friend, you're on the edge of a domestic precipice. And if I let you give the women one more chance, they'll pitch... What are you talking about? When my light is out. I'll take one little look around the grounds and a peep up the staircase as well. I'll meet you in the library. It is. Well, it's a crisis in our affairs, Percival. How so? Some ice cold water with pleasure. A spoon and a basin of sugar. Or sucre, my friend, nothing more. For a man of your age? Ah. Mix your own sickly mess. <laughs> you foreigners are all alike. Pardon me if I shock your fire in national tastes by mixing myself another glass. the one quality. Animals, children and women all fail it. Every provocation you instantly accept. Your mad temper has lost you the signature on the deed, the ready money, set Miss Halcombe writing to the lawyers the first time. She's written again? Yes, today. Can you look at Miss Halcombe and not see that she has the foresight and resolution of a man? Percival, Percival, you deserve to fail. And you have failed. Yes. Yes, bully, bluster as much as you like. Say what's to be done, that's harder. Is it? This is what is to be done. You give up all direction in this business from tonight. You leave the future in my hands only. Yes or no? Say it is. What then? I must know everything. These debts of yours that make my poverty-stricken hair stand on end. There is really and truly no earthly means of paying them except by way of your wife. None. Does nothing come to you from your wife? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Except in the case of her death.
Rain has come at last. Percival, do you care about your wife? Fosco, that's a downright question. I'm a downright man. You won't answer me? Well, then, let us say your wife dies before the summer is out. Drop it, Bosco. Let us say your wife dies. Drop it, I said. How much then do you gain? 20,000 pounds. Paid down? Paid down. And you want money at once? Well, speak for yourself as well as me. You stand to gain. My wife's death would be 10,000 pounds in your wife's pocket. Don't look at me like that. You make my flesh creep. Do lawyers who make wills? Like them, I speak of your wife's death as a possibility. My business tonight is to clear up your position, and I have. If your wife lives, you pay those debts only with her signature. If she dies, you pay them with her death. Now, Percival, having settled money matters for tonight, what about this private difficulty of yours? Speak, my friend. It isn't easy to know where to begin. Shall I help you? Shall I give it a name? And Catherine? It doesn't concern you. <laughs> Come, my. Let us be candid one with another. This secret of yours has sought me. I have not sought it. Do you ask me as your old friend to respect your secret and leave it once and for all in your keeping? Yes. Then my curiosity dies in me from this moment. What makes you doubt me? I know your roundabout ways. Percival, Percival, you know me no better than that. I'm a man of the anti-type, capable of the most exalted acts of virtue. It's the misfortune of my life. I've had so few chances of performing them. You poor, superficial Englishman. I could draw your secret out of you if I liked as I draw this finger from the palm of my hand. But the duties of friendship are sacred to me. See, I trample my base curiosity under my feet. My exalted sentiments lift me above it. Personal, personal. Shake hands. I forgive you. No, no. When my friend has wounded me, I can pardon him without apologies. You want my help? Yes. Badly enough. Fosco, I'm a lost man if I don't find her. Yes, your face speaks truth this time. Worse than money matters. Hmm? You saw the note she left for my wife, the promises to go on meeting. Fosco, she knows my secret. From you? No, from her mother. Two women in possession of your private mind? Bad, bad, my friend. Anne Catherick is in this neighborhood. And she has told my wife, deny it as she may. One moment, personally. Surely as your wife, it's in her interest to keep it. It might be in her interest if she cared two straws about me. But she's in love with a vagabond called Hartwright. She was in love with him before she married me. She's in love with him now. Hartwright helped Anne Catherick to escape from the madhouse. Hartwright met her again in Liveridge. He knows my secret. And now Laura knows it. I once let them get together again. <laughs> Are you insensible to the virtue of Lady Glyde? That for her virtue. 
I believe in nothing about her but her money. Where is this Mr. Harper? He's abroad. I had him watch. I see. So the finding of Anne Catherick is the first necessity. The rest involved are here under your thumb. Is her mother to be depended upon? Yes. She told your secret once. She won't tell it again. But all I need to know is how to recognize our invisible Anne. What's she like? Like? I can tell you in two words. She's a sickly version of my wife. What? made a cooling lotion and a mixture, but Miss Halcombe declined the mixture. The Count? It is serious, good sir. You are a doctor? Mine, regretfully, is the comment of one who has studied medicine unprofessionally. I am not accustomed, sir, to consult with amateur physicians. The least noise in the house, the better. I shall be by the lakeside. for me from Miss Halcombe. How is she? Very well, sir. Thank you. And Lady Glyde? I've been dismissed, sir. Well, is that my fault? Miss Halcombe gave me two letters, one for London, one for you. Then, when she'd gone back, I was at the inn, sir. Madame Fosco had come in with some more messages, just as I was warming the pot. Warming the pot? She made me some tea, all nice. And I quite passed out, sir. Then, sir, when I woke up, sir, she'd gone. And she hadn't told me the extra messages from Lady Glyde, sir. But the letter was still in my bosom, even if it is a bit crumpled. <laughs> Perhaps the messages were important, sir. And I don't want Lady Glyde thinking I'm neglectful, sir. I'd be very much obliged if you'd kindly tell me what I'd better do. Let things stop as they are. Is that all? If you think it a liberty in me to write, of course I wouldn't, but all I want is to serve my mistress. Good night. She creaked. Shoes. Her bones? Her stays, sir. Expecting someone, ma'am? I myself am waiting for somebody. 
I have a message from Lady Glyde. Are you the person? Person? Miss Anne Catherick. Oh, no, sir. I'm my friend, poor thing. Then perhaps I might entrust the message to you. It is important. Please, sir, she's waiting. Lady Glyde entreats Miss Catherine to return to London immediately. But, sir... As she is certain Sir Percival will discover her if she remains any longer in the neighbourhood of Blackwater. Lady Glyde is herself going to London shortly. And if she will go there first, let Lady Glyde know her address, then she will hear from her and see her in a fortnight or less. I'd like nothing more than to take her to London, but she's ill. I can't move her. You have sought medical advice, ma'am. Well, it's difficult. We, we don't want our position public. I myself am a medical man. If it pleases you, ma'am, I'll go back with you and we shall see what can be done. Oh, please, sir. We are only at Sandon. Druggist in Santa Mar. Yes, sir, yes. I will prescribe a powerful stimulant. It will certainly make Anne strong enough to bear the fatigue of a short journey to London of only a few hours. I will meet you at the station and see you off by the midday train. Fosco, come in here and tell me. Whenever there are women in the house, they're sure to be going up and down stairs. My good person, Mrs. Mitchelson has duties. Pray recognize her admirable performance of them as sincerely as I do. How is the sufferer, ma'am? No better, my lord, I regret to say. Sad, it's most sad. Fosco! You look fatigued. I think I may be the means of offering you and my wife some help in nursing. Circumstances have arisen which oblige Madame Fosco to travel to London either tomorrow or the next day. And she will bring back with her a nurse of excellent conduct and capacity. But nothing please to the doctor, because he will look with an evil eye on any help of my providing. When she appears, Mr. Dawson will be obliged to acknowledge there is no reason for not employing her. And Lady Glyde will say the same. Damn it, Fosco! Pray present my best regards and sympathies to Lady Glyde. not to be hasty in our judgments on our inferiors, especially when they come from foreign parts. You must rest. No one to help me. The Count said to send to London for advice. Do you think Mr. Dawson is wrong? He said this morning there was no fear and no need to send for another doctor. With all respect, Mr. Dawson, in your ladyship's case, I should heed the Count's advice. His advice? Oh, God help us. His advice? May I make a suggestion, at once the simplest and most profound? Will you let me alter the light in your room? If you will be so very kind as not to let any of it in on me. Light is the first essential. Light stimulates, it nourishes, it preserves. You can no more do without it, Mr. Fairley, than if you were a flower. Observe, there where you sit, I close the curtain to compose you. <laughs> 
And there, where you do not sit, I let in the invigorating sun. Light, sir, is the grand decree of providence. On oh, my word of honor, sir, you see me confounded in your presence. Mm. I'm shocked to hear it, I'm sure. In the presence of a man of such refined sympathies, I'm conscious of a terrible necessity to lacerate them by referring to domestic events of a very melancholy kind. Anybody dead? Dead? In the name of heaven, what have I said to make you think me the messenger of death? Inexpressibly relieved. Anybody ill? Yes. Grieved, I'm sure. Which of them is it? Perhaps when Miss Halcombe did not come here as you proposed and did not write a second time, your affectionate anxiety may have made you fear that she was ill. Is it serious? But not dangerous. Miss Halcombe unhappily caught a cold which has aggravated into a fever. Good God! Is it infectious? Except my personal assurances when I last saw her. No. Will you kindly excuse an invalid, but long conferences of any kind invariably upset me. The object of my visit is twofold. First, sir, I inform you, as the head of Lady Glyde's family, Miss Halcombe has exaggerated nothing in her letter. A temporary separation between man and wife is necessary, and the only remedy that will spare you the horror of public scandal. Lady Glyde is innocent, injured, yes. But by that very count, the cause of irritation while she remains under her husband's roof, no other house can receive her with propriety but yours. I invite you to open. Ah. Second, oh. you were most right, sir, in hesitating to receive the wife until you were quite sure the husband would not exert his authority to reclaim her. I, Fosco, I who know Sir Percival better than Miss Halcombe knows him, affirm on my honor he will not come near this house nor attempt to communicate with this house while his wife lives in it. His affairs are embarrassed. Offer him his freedom by means of the absence of Lady Glyde. I promise you he will take it. Go back to the continent at the earliest moment. Is this clear to you as crystal? Yes, it is. Are there any questions you wish to put to me? Um, many thanks. I am sinking fast. In my state of health, I must take things for granted. Allow me to do so now. We, we quite understand one another. Yes, yes. Uh, much obliged to you for your kind interference. If ever I get better and have a second opportunity of improving our acquaintance. One moment before I take my leave. Oh. You must not think of waiting till Miss Halcombe recovers before you receive Lady Clyde. Miss Halcombe will be looked after. But her illness has already affected the health and spirits of Lady Clyde. Please, therefore, do your incontestable duty. And whatever happens in the future, no one can blame you. Write to Lady Glyde to come here at once. I offer my friendly advice. Is it accepted, yes or no? You hesitate? Ah, oh, I understand, Mr. Fairley. You object that Lady Glyde is not in health to make the journey and that her maid has been dismissed. I have a house at St. John's Wood. Observe the program I now propose. She travels to London, a short journey. I myself meet her at the station. She rests at the house, which is also the home of your sister. I escort her to the station again. She travels to this place and is met by her maid. Here is comfort, here is propriety, and here, Mr. Fairley, is your duty. Dearest Laura, please come whenever you like. Break the journey in London by staying at your aunt's house. Grieve to hear of Marion's illness ever affectionately. I am entirely prostrate. I can do no more. Will you 
lunch and rest downstairs, love to all and sympathy and, and so on. Good morning. change happened? The morning before last. Have you and Madame Rebel been made aware of the full extent of the mischief? That it is contagious. It is typhus fever. <laughs> 